Medical marijuana is legal here in Florida, right? Not just yet. Amendment 2 passed with 71% support in November, but the victory is not the end of the effort. State lawmakers will now have to resolve the regulatory process. The ballot language says there will be access for individuals with debilitating medical conditions determined by a licensed Florida physician. But what does that cover? There are also questions about how much a person can possess at one time, how many dispensaries can operate, and who can cultivate the plants. Joining us for more on how these different elements could get worked out is neurologist Ronald Ungdin and attorney Morgan Bentley. Gentlemen, thank you very much for, for joining us. Dr. Number one, you have been the proponent for this for a number of years now. How did you get to this point? It was a process of enlightenment. I'd been somewhat misinformed by the effects of cannabis, known as marijuana. And being traditionally trained as a physician, uh, there was a lot of stigma and misinformation that was out there. But as a neurologist, I deal with serious diseases, debilitating diseases, which uh, the conditions for which were not being met adequately by traditional medicine, specifically seizures. So that allowed me to start looking into it, and particularly the weed series by Sanjay Gupta, who was a neurosurgeon. We saw that. Uh, was very convincing, if you saw it, in terms of the potential, the, the Charlotte's Web, and all how the desperate people were having to leave their states to go to Colorado to obtain this medical cannabis. And as I started looking into it, uh, I began to see that there was significant amount of literature out there and that even in America, from 1850 to 1937, when it became banned, cannabis was commonly practiced and used in traditional medicine by big pharma companies such as Park Davis and Eli Lilly that we know now. But Morgan, what critics will say is that there is no real scientific evidence that it is effective. There hasn't been any federally recognized study by the federal government that, that says that. And uh, so therefore, everybody wants to be sensitive to people who are fighting debilitating diseases, but there's really no science behind this. Uh, right. I guess I'd narrow that in a little bit. There's no science as to what it is about cannabis that makes the result happen. Um, for instance, you mentioned Charlotte's Web. I mean, one of the criticisms of Charlotte's Web was, well, it's narrowly, it's taking one section of this non-THC substance, and no one has any idea of the, what, 400 and some odd different substances that are found in, in marijuana. What, which of those or which combinations of those actually creates any effect, if there is any effect? And so it's, it's, it, it's, it's tough. So it raises the question, if we're going to do this, what are we going to do it for? Are we going to do it for uh, the kind of neurologic uh, uh, diseases that you often uh, uh, treat? Uh, where do you start and where do you stop? Well, things like seizures are very um, easy to determine whether there's an effect for a drug. In fact, a lot of drugs use seizures as a means to determine efficacy because you either have seizures or you don't, and you have less seizures or you don't. So seizures are commonly used, and that's where one of the places where cannabis has been found useful. As far as studies, when you look, there are a lot of studies, even back in the 1850s to the year 1900, there were 100 studies that were published. And even most recently, there were about 60 studies that were published. Yes, they were not by the uh, FDA or so, so forth, but there is also a patent filed by the U.S. government, by the Department of Health and Human Services in 2003, which states that there is, they have exclusive rights for the use of cannabis for certain diseases. Right, so now it's up to the legislature to determine what diseases are debilitating and you have proponents and opponents in the legislature. The new House Speaker, Richard Corcoran, said, uh, you know, all I could say is we're going to honor the uh, voters, we're going to protect the Constitution, and we're going to protect the, the people of Florida. That's a little bit vague. <laughs> well, that's, you know, he's the Speaker of the House. That's what they, that's how they talk. Um, well, and I'd actually back up one, one more uh, point in that. The first step is it's, it's not the legislature that decides whether the de other debilitating diseases are similar to the ones listed in the ordinance. It's the physician. Right. So the physician actually makes that determination, which is going to be problem number one, because you're, you're now the legislature arguably has no ability to make that decision at all. So right. that's problem one. All right. Why don't we pause right there, because there's so much more to talk about it. We'll have more with our roundtable coming up. But when we return, we'll bring you a check on our weather forecast. So stay with us. 
Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we are discussing how Florida, Florida's legislature could end up regulating medical marijuana now that Amendment 2 has passed. Our guests tonight are neurologist Dr. Ronald Ogden and attorney Morgan Bentley. Um, so there is a, a number of steps that have to take place, and it begins, doctor, if you could explain, with the Department of Health. Well, first of all, the Department of Health allowed physicians to take a test, which was about eight hours long, at a price of about $1,000 on cannabis. And with that, if you passed it, you were certified to prescribe medical marijuana. Initially, before Amendment 2, there were two categories of uh, medical cannabis. One was low THC, high CBD, indicated for seizures, intractable spasms, and for cancer. Then the high THC component was for people with cancer with just one year to live, and you had to have two physicians certify that. With Amendment 2, things were much more open in that it was left to the physician to determine that their patient had a debilitating, chronic debilitating condition. Still, not everyone is on the same page in, in terms of medical marijuana, and the question is, what can the Department of Health do to actually slow down what Amendment 2 sought to do, and what can the Florida legislature do right. to slow it down? Because the House Speaker, it says right here, is not a, uh, a supporter of medical marijuana. Right. So it's actually a two-step process. You don't get to the Department of Health until you go through the legislature. So the legislature sets the rules. You got the Constitution, then you have the legislature, then you have the Department of Health. So actually, the Department of Health can only make regulations that are in line with whatever statutory scheme the legislature provides them. And there's a, there's a whole body of law about whether they're inside or outside the lines, basically. So first step is the legislature. And then, yeah, the Department of Health could do anything that they wanted, frankly, in terms of rulemaking. Uh, one is take a long time. Um, that's, that's, that's way, to, if your question is how to gum it up, that's one. The second is they could try to define what other debilitating uh, diseases are. Um, and that would spark a whole series of court cases about whether, say, for instance, a particular type of, of disease is similar to PTSD or to cancer. Because that's what the, or, that's what the, the amendment says, is, is it's other similar debilitating diseases. So ultimately, that's going to be for the courts to decide. Right. There are a lot of things I want to get to, but we'll start with the law goes into effect next month. People are going to start you know, prescribing it, but can the state shut it down if it... it so choose. It'll be an interesting question. The issue of moratoriums is going to be front and center on this. Um, and, you know, I, I think a, there's a little bit of um, caution at the beginning until the rules are fleshed out, but technically you could. But not just the state, but also every uh, city or, or other local government could establish a moratorium if they wanted starting January 1. Now, whether which we're those, seeing around here. Which we are seeing around here. And whether those will be upheld as unconstitutional or not, I don't know. Um, I'm guessing not, but you know, uh, I'm not the judge, um, and, so, and so yeah, there's there's a a little a little bit of caution. There is also a conflict between state law and federal law. It is on the schedule. Was it no, uh, control systems category one, which states no medical benefit and highly addictive, similar to heroin. Right now, currently, the Obama administration has not uh, gone after anyone. On, on that basis, after all, you know, medical marijuana and even recreational man, uh, marijuana is, is being passed in other states. But there is a new sheriff in town in, in Washington, and the incoming attorney general uh, is, is a, a vocal opponent of medical marijuana. So, Dr., do you have any guesses of, of what could possibly happen now? Uh, it's it's going to be a very interesting situation because the states have their own rules, which are contrary to the U.S. government's rules, federal rules. But to me, as a physician, the key point is getting patients better and not allowing them to suffer and fall through the cracks that traditional medicine has allowed. And so, as a physician, I'm pledged to take care of patients and their welfare. And the legality comes alongside of that. And it's going to be a very interesting uh, situation of how objective people get on both sides to get this thing done right. But, you know, you, you have people on the other side of this issue who have um, legitimately strong-held beliefs uh, that, uh, that they believe that even medical marijuana is a gateway. Uh, they're even Democrats. I, I know uh, my friend Patrick Kennedy uh, is an opponent of it, and uh, that he believes that it can be misused, and he is, is concerned about that. Exactly. 
I was misinformed at one time, and as I looked into it, I became informed and more educated on medical cannabis, and that's what changed my mind. So I think part of the job is going to be education. And cannabis, like alcohol, cigarettes, it's not the substance that is problematic. It's the personality also. Not everybody that drinks becomes an alcoholic. And in the same way, there are people that I know who are using medical cannabis who don't use it for, quote, recreational purposes. Furthermore, if you're using it for, quote, recreational purposes to treat anxiety or insomnia, is that any worse than narcotics or Xanax or benzodiazepines? So, you know, there has to be this balance of across the board of danger and uh, and benefits. Morgan, do you know if other states who have legalized medical marijuana have gone through this kind of debate after it became legal in terms of opponents and supporters uh, trying to either get it a system that's working or try to close it down? Absolutely. Uh, and, and the other thing we haven't mentioned is there's a, a as to the opponents, is the, the criminality concern because you do have this disconnect between the federal government and the state government in terms of the money. And you know you hear certainly, uh, and, and it may be allegorical, it may be not um, as accurate as as we think, but you hear stories of a lot of cash in dispensaries and increases in robberies and things like that, and you have a legitimate concern about what to do with all that cash. Well, specifically, and, and this still has not been worked out, it's the banking issue because right. it is on the Schedule One uh, in terms of uh, under the federal government being an illegal drug. Right. Uh, in theory, you cannot open an account right. in an FDIC-insured bank. In theory, now there are. I'm sure there are banks that do. Um, I'm sure there are lots of state banks that are picking up the slack. Um, but yeah, it's a problem, and that's why you hear stories out of places like Colorado or California where you, you know they've got a lot of just cash, and that's a target for for crime. Now, whether that's true or not remains to be seen. I mean, they're they're they're, they're so different in the way they regulate these. Um, some states are very wide open. Um, a dispensary wherever a zoning law might allow it. Others are extremely strict about where and how and when um, it can be dispensed and by who, um, not just any doctor. Uh, doctor, I would imagine that uh, in the coming months, once the state legislature comes back into session, they're going to be holding hearings about this. Uh, do you have a, a desire to go up there to Tallahassee to, to uh, lobby in terms of, of what you believe in, and in terms of trying to explain and get over some of, uh, of, some of the opposition of it? Yeah, I've come to realize my biggest role is education, particularly first with my fellow physicians, because that's where the bottleneck is. If the doctors don't believe in it and its benefits, then they're not going to prescribe it. And so, yes, I'm very open to it. In fact, I've been asked by the Pasco County commissioners to come next week to talk to their commissioners about to educate them on medical cannabis. Because they're considering a moratorium? Yes. Uh, is it possible for you to say, in terms of the uh, physicians that you deal with, what percentage are on board and, and, and what percentage still has reservations? Well, put it this way, in the state of Florida, there are, I believe, 45,000 physicians. And there are less than 150 physicians certified to prescribe medical marijuana at this time. I was number 42 back in January. and. Uh, of those physicians that are certified, I heard that only 50% are prescribing it. In Sarasota itself, I was the first one, and now there are apparently three, in Saras three additional ones in Sarasota County physicians. I, I, I am sure that will grow in the, the coming months or, or years ahead. All right, we're going to take a, a brief break here, but when we return, we'll have final thoughts from our guests, plus what some of our viewers are saying about our new drone regulations, our story last night. We won't know exactly how medical marijuana will be regulated until sometime during the spring in the new legislation. Our guests uh, have some of their own speculation about that, and they join us now for some uh, final thoughts. So, Doctor, where do you think we're going to be a year from now? You know, Florida is a very conservative state, but I'm proud to say that um, things are starting to open up, and we're conservative, so we're taking small steps because we don't want to go too far ahead and have to back up. So that's a good thing. But I'm hoping that there's going to be more education and programs like this are very necessary so that people are open. Just like I was uh, at one time misinformed and now I'm more informed and now appreciate the real objective facts about cannabis. So I'm hoping that not only is there going to be a better education, but the 
the lawmakers will also be sensitive to patient needs, that there needs to be a coming together of meeting of needs and of the laws to protect the people as well. And, and Morgan, uh, is it possible to even guess where we're going to be legally in terms of the battle over this a year from now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, number one, we know it's a big enough lobby in favor of medical marijuana that, that they, they won't shut it down in the legislature, number one. Number two is they will come up with some statutory framework this session. So by the end of the spring, there will be a statutory framework. Number three is we'll know we'll be in rulemaking with the Department of Health by then. We may be done with it by this time next year. I kind of doubt we'll be all the way through that process, so that, that'll take care of the state. And at the local level, we'll know, A, whether the moratoriums are going to be widespread, whether they're going to be upheld, and basically kind of how the zoning is going to go. Um, you know you're going to have restrictions for schools and churches, et cetera. You're probably going to have some specific zoning um, restrictions. And I think all that's going to shake out a year from now at least in the big picture, not with the specifics. All right, and we have to leave it there. But before we go, we want to share with you what some of our viewers are saying about last night's topic, drone regulations. Commercial drone users now have to get a license to operate. They'll face restrictions keeping them from flying near airports and certain altitudes. We asked you what you thought about the rules, and here's what some of you are saying. Sam Leonard writes, the government is way behind on this. Of course we need to strict regulation on objects flying around and the potential for criminal and terrorist acts. Dan Korinsky writes, maybe some local regulations or enforcement, how long before one drops on a crowd at a parade? And Tom Whitlock writes, California and a couple of other states have already enacted legislation making it illegal to fly a drone over someone else's property without permission if the drone is equipped with a camera. I suspect other states, to include Florida, will probably follow suit. Well, if you'd like to join the conversation about tonight's topic, just visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash news at seven. And FYI, want to watch past roundtable discussions? They're available on Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Roku. Thank you to our guests for being here tonight. Dr. Ronald Ogden is a neurologist here in Sarasota, and Morgan Bentley is an attorney with Bentley and Bruning Private Attorneys.